do a uh, video on uh, making a beat frequency oscillator, a BFO. Um, I think we'll do this in two parts, two short videos. One will be a bipolar based uh, BFO and the second will be an FET based BFO. And uh, we're going to solve a problem with the first one. It's a receiver that uh, unfortunately never got one. So we're going to add an external BFO to an existing receiver. In the second one, um, we're going to use a uh, ceramic resonator based BFO. The first one is going to be a free running oscillator. Hope you enjoy these two videos on beat frequency oscillators. Before we get into a problem and design approach with our BFO, let's review what a BFO or beat frequency oscillator is and why we need it. In the early days of radio, transmitters were basically spark gap sets and damped wave sets that put out a form of code transmission that was quite musical or at least raucous in nature. Their natural buzz or tone could easily be demodulated by the early crystal sets. When true continuous wave or CW came along in the form of radio frequency alternators and early vacuum tube oscillators, the crystal sets could not produce a tone in their headphones. There were some schemes for artificially perturbing the signal into some kind of tone through a chopper device or a local modulating device, but basically until the regenerative receiver with its self-oscillation feature came into use, you had a real problem with CW and your crystal set. One early method was to provide a separate CW signal that was broadcast just off frequency from the signal you were trying to receive. This heterodyne service transmitting station was for all stations that were trying to receive that one frequency. Today we would call this a BFO service station. Soon it was discovered that a vacuum tube oscillator located at the set could provide this beat note. This was a flexible and effective system and it still works with crystal sets today. When a super heterodyne receiver came along, the beat note no longer had to be produced near the actual operating frequency. It could be injected at the intermediate frequency. The simple introduction of the BFO, lightly coupled to the last IF stage or to the AM detector itself, was the way CW was demodulated for the next 40 years. In an AM receiver with a fairly wide passband, it mattered little which side the BFO was on. For instance, if you want to produce an 800 or 1000 Hz tone in the headphones, it could be 800 or 1000 Hz above or 800 or 1000 Hz below the CW carrier frequency. If you have interference, you sometimes can reduce it by injecting the BFO on the other side of the carrier. It's actually a nice feature to have a wide tuning BFO with an old fashioned wide IF receiver. When narrow filters were developed specifically to improve CW reception, these sometimes had an uneven filter shape and it became advantageous to place the BFO either above or below the frequency so as to take advantage of the filter shape for a maximum single signal selectivity effect. Unlike CW, when single sideband or SSB transmissions became possible, and eventually dominant, the BFO frequency now had to be placed exactly in the center where the missing carrier should be in order to demodulate either the upper or lower sideband into the baseband, speech, or music. To recover the original signal from the centered single sideband signal in the IF, the single sideband must be frequency shifted down to its original range of baseband frequencies. For audio communications, the BFO oscillator will be shifted about 1.7 kHz from where you see the most sideband energy in the passband. What we are doing is re-injecting the carrier so that the AM demodulator now has something similar to an AM signal to work with. Actually, it's single sideband AM that we produced with our BFO. The proper term for the single sideband BFO is a CIO, or a carrier reinsertion oscillator. Its name implies its true purpose, and therefore it must be tuned exactly on the non-existent carrier frequency. So if your IF is 455 kilohertz, and you have, an ac you have accurately tuned in your single sideband signal, the CIO must be on 455 kilohertz to resolve the audio. It won't matter whether the signal is upper sideband or lower sideband to a receiver with a wide enough IF bandpass to pass the full carrier AM station's audio. For instance, for 455 kilohertz IF, that carrier reinsertion needs to be right at 455 kilohertz. 
If you're adding a BFO to an older receiver with a wide enough passband, like an AM band with the 5 to 10 kilohertz, that's how it works. The BFO goes right in the middle. However, with modern receivers with narrow filters, specifically designed for single sideband, this scheme completely changes. This filter is designed to pass just the baseband frequencies of the upper or lower sideband. Now the suppressed or missing carrier is located at one end of the filter, not in the middle anymore. So in the case of USB, the BFO must usually be tuned to the lower side of the filter, and in lower sideband, the BFO is usually tuned at the upper side of the filter. So the BFO is actually located just outside the passband of the filter, because what is passed is usually 300 through 2800 hertz. It's just the sideband or baseband energy. So one thing that's a little bit hard to understand, but uh, once you start working with diodes, you realize that they are a non-linear device, and they operate best in the square law region uh, for detection. That means that even this simple crystal set is using a diode in the non-linear region most of the time. Um, the single-ended mixer is nothing more than a crystal set where you're putting in two frequencies, but instead of integrating at the output of the detector, you take the sum and the difference frequencies that are generated. It can also be considered to be a product detector. That's right, a single-ended diode is a form of product detector. It's not that product detectors are more linear, it's that product detectors are more nonlinear over a wider dynamic range than the simple single-ended okay, diode. Enough theory. We need to build something. At least I didn't get into mathematics with this. This is the ICOM IC100 receiver. It's an AM-FM uh, scanner type receiver. Covers a wide frequency range including uh, low frequencies and the shortwave band. But it's missing something very important. That's right, they forgot to put a BFO in it. So I think this is a great candidate radio to try to add a BFO and see if we can do some sideband demodulation. Works good on AM. Not so good on sideband. And of course if we went down to CW get too excited yet. I did identify that it had a uh, very simple diode detector. And uh, all I'm going to do is use my generator to generate a BFO signal to see if this thing will even accept a BFO. Okay, don't hyperventilate. I've just tacked on a 10 picofarad capacitor on one of the diodes. I've got the, uh, the other side of the generator grounded to chassis. So this proves that we could probably add a BFO to this receiver. It would be useful for some signals, not all. So what we're doing is uh, we're looking for a spot in the circuit where we can inject the BFO, where the BFO will be strong enough to produce a single sideband or a CW tone. CW is much easier to achieve than sideband. But it looks like 
at the particular spot that I've picked in the circuit, which is the last IF amplifier's base. So it's not the actual detector diodes, but the stage before it. And it's a, a modest gain uh, amplifier. I'm injecting about 190 millivolts, it looks like, on the meter. 190 millivolts RMS of 456 kilohertz, 457 kilohertz type BFO in order to uh, to operate here on 40. That's that's a good level. If I were to try to inject the BFO into the detector diodes themselves, which is, might be a better place to do it for more linearity, I would have to put probably several volts because uh, I'm coupling very lightly through a 10 picofarad capacitor. So that's that 190 or 200 millivolts RMS of injection is something I can deal with without desensing the whole radio. And notice I'm using a piece of coax right across and shielding. There's a uh, IF can just before the detector and that's the output of that uh, transistor that I'm injecting. Nice ground point. So I'm grounding on both sides and then I have a 10 picofarad farad capacitor that's injecting right into the base of that final amplifier. So keep everything shielded with coax and then do the 10 picofarad capacitor right at the last point and that's a high impedance point and that's why we want the very very light coupling so as not to disturb the the circuit. Also I found a place where I could find 5 volts DC and I've brought power out. That power is going to be what we use to power our BFO. Basically, uh, if we turn that injection up too high, it's going to start to desense the receiver. And that's what we might be seeing here. So let's lower, lower the output a little bit. Let's bring it down to 150. As you can see, it did go down. So we are desensing a little bit. I'm down to 150 on the meter now. You have to be careful that you don't put in so much injection that you actually start to desense the receiver. So if you want to build a BFO circuit, we have so many choices. You can literally wind your own coil like this, and we can use an Armstrong or a Hartley type wind, you know, with an air wound coil. You could come up with a, a ferrite tunable coil and wind on that and that would give you the, the basis for an oscillator at 455 kilohertz. We really want to tune from about uh, 450 kilohertz up to 400 and uh, maybe 60 kilohertz, maybe not that much, but you want to have a, a tuning range that allow you to do both the upper and lower sideband. And with a very wide and stepped tuning like we had in that uh, scanner we were playing with, it becomes more of a clarifier control than it becomes a BFO control. You're covering such a wide frequency to be able to uh, cover a signal that's within those 5 kilohertz steps. So you'd, you'd rather have it set for 1 kilohertz steps or even 500 hertz steps to properly uh, use a BFO. So you're going to be able to tune it either with the slug as with a slug tune coil or you're probably going to want a tunable capacitor to act as your clarifier control or your BFO tuning control. I'm showing a simple trimmer here. Here's a nice old-fashioned uh, capacitor with a couple plates left on it. That probably would work. Here's one that's a screwdriver adjust 25 picofarad uh, capacitor. All of those would work. Some people like to have a high and a low switch. So when you put it in high, it uh, puts you one side of uh, zero beat. Low, it puts you on the other side of zero beat. 
but uh, having a fixed type BFO really isn't too uh, logical for a simple circuit like we're, we're working with. We want to have something that is tunable. Uh, the IF cans that are in some of the older radios, uh, plenty of 455 kilohertz IF cans, those can be the basis for the coil and usually they have both center tap and a secondary so you can use either the Armstrong or a Hartley or a Cole Pitts, whatever you want to do and they make a good basis for the BFO. Crystal controlled BFO, high side, low side, upper side band, lower side band. That's going to be hard to accomplish because uh, we need some tunability in this circuit um, unless we use a series capacitor to warp the crystal uh, like a VXO, variable crystal oscillator. Resonators are easy to work with. You can get these for 455 very inexpensively. And you have to pick what kind of device you'd like to use. We've got 5 volts to work with, which means we could work with a bipolar transistor, field effect transistor, or a MOSFET. Any of those would work fine in our circuit. So I think we're going to attempt two different styles of BFO. We're going to attempt a coil type, and we're going to attempt a ceramic resonator type. And either one of those should work well with our ICOM receiver. So i got a couple circuits that I downloaded off the internet. We'll just play with these topologies. Both of them are Hartleys. Both should work with the small IF transformer. This is a, the black top, which usually is used in the final stage of uh, super heterodyne pocket radios. Usually that's the one that's feeding the detector. So it typically has a uh, medium impedance on the input that's tapped and a low impedance on the output that goes to the detector diodes. We could go with an FET like an MPF-102 or uh, the 5486 as shown here or 3819 or any of those FETs. You just have to watch the uh, pinouts because they're all different. Or we could go with a simple NPN transistor like a uh, BC-109 or a 2N2222 or even a germanium type NPN, that would be fine. So either of these circuits. I think we'll do the bipolar first, get that working uh, in the spirit of the, uh, the ICOM. They use a lot of bipolars in the IF. So I guess we'll try this a This gives us an opportunity to talk about those funny little colored transformers you see in the old transistor radios. You can still get these, by the way, from places like Mauser and uh, you can you can use them in a lot of your circuits if you're willing to uh, remove them from old radios or uh, or you can find them new or surplus as you can see on this radio we have a red a yellow a white and a black so uh, the red is your oscillator coil that's your broadcast band oscillator coil can I make an oscillator out of it? Well, yes, you can. You could make a nice wireless broadcaster, part 15 broadcaster, out of that coil. This is the first IF transformer, the white one. Uh, I'm sorry, the yellow one is the first IF transformer. The white one is the second IF. And the black one is the third IF that connects to the detector diode. Any of these are useful for making the uh, BFO we want. We could use the yellow, the white, or the black. They have different ratios and usually they have an uneven center tap. So you can use them to advantage in a Hartley circuit. Uh, we're going to use a black one and I've already sweat soldered a black one onto the board that we're going to be using for our oscillator. The ratio is not that important as long as it's fairly high to fairly low. And we're going to use the secondary of the transformer to our advantage to drive the coax to the receiver. So we would like to determine uh, what's going on with the transformer and uh, figure out the primary and the secondary and so on. And we can use our ordinary multimeter to do this. The secondary, uh, we can try to measure that impedance first. Across the secondary, it's very low, about 0 0.5, 0 0.6 ohms. And now we do the primary. This is center tapped. Looks like about 6 ohms. 
Let's measure one side to the center tap. Okay, I get about 3.6, 3.5 ohms. And now the other side to the center tap. Okay, about 2.7. So the center tap is closer to this side than this side. We're going to use that to our advantage when we design the uh, Hartley oscillator. Okay, so redrawing the transformer. The B plus is going to go to the center tap. The collector is going to go to the higher resistance side, which is over here. And the base is going to go to the lower resistance side over here. So that's how we're going to hook up the transformer, according to this. Okay. So the low resistance side was over here. So that's going to be the base side. And the collector wants to go to the higher impedance. More turns. So this should work okay for our Hartley. If it's absolutely in the center, of course it doesn't matter which side. But um, usually these coils are offset. And that actually can work fine with a Hartley. You don't need all of that feedback. You only need to have about 25% of the coil involved for the center tap and that's where the plus goes. Okay, so there were some folks that were complaining that I was using parts that were too old, too large, antique parts in other words. So this one I I kind of built it the, uh, the way that uh, you would with modern circuitry just on a piece of board and I kept it small. So I'm using uh, eighth watt or smaller resistors, little tiny capacitors and so on. You can't even see the thing. Anyway, um, I did not want to just use a one meg resistor like they show in their schematic. I wanted to use uh, some decent biasing. I did ground the emitter, but I stuck a uh, kind of a placeholder resistor from the base to ground, a 33K. And then I just stuck a 100K resistor uh, to B+, plus just to get some bias into the transistor. I've done no calculations. I'm just hoping to bias the transistor on enough that it can oscillate. So let's see what's going on here. So we're going to apply power. I set the power supply for 4.7 volts, just to give myself a little bit of margin, because we are going to use a 5 volt supply. So let's look at our scope over here. I'm going to attach the positive lead to the to the bottom of this thing. Oh, okay. So this is what happens every time, right? You just hook it up and it works. No, that doesn't happen very often. But this is such a simple circuit that all you need to do is really bias the the transistor a little bit, and it's going to oscillate. We've got this fine IF transformer. It's got a center tap that's offset just like we want for a Hartley. We're coupling right off that output into the scope and it is immediately reading. So let's see what frequency this thing might be on. Okay. 485 kilohertz. So it's high. I'd rather be high than, than low. So the next thing we want to do is see if uh, our output is in the range that we wanted. We wanted 100 to 200 millivolts of injection. And I'm simulating the load with a, a 620 ohm resistor and a uh, the same value coupling capacitor I used in the radio, which is a 10 puff. And it looks like we have about 620 millivolts RMS. So we're on the high side. But I'd rather be on that side. Uh, we can always pat it down a little bit if it's uh, if it's too much injection. Yeah. So it turns out that um, the coil by itself, you know, it tunes all the way up. We can easily get up to uh, 500 kilohertz with it. And we can go down to just about 400, 413. So hitting 455 is no sweat. So we're going to use it just as it is. And we'll put some kind of a tuning control on it, like this. 
and hopefully that'll give us enough adjustment. Okay, some of you like the 2N3904 and it works just as well. No problem. So any NPN type transistor is going to work fine in this circuit. And for you fanatical PNP people, I just flip the power supply leads and it works just fine with a PNP as well. Before we mount the BFO in its uh, little box that we prepared, um, we want to set it for the center and I've got it centered up and we have an adjustment here with the transformer where we can uh, adjust the uh, the thing to 455 exactly or close enough. And now we're, this is where we see how our BFO adjust is going to uh, work for us. So let's go down and at full mesh looks like we're only able to go down about 1.5 kilohertz and at full open same thing 1.5 kilohertz high so that's 3 kilohertz total that's a little bit light I'd like to about double that really for the BFO but this is what happens when we just grab a capacitor out of the junk box. This capacitor used to have several plates, but somebody took all the plates off, and now it's only got a couple left. So it's not perfect. You'd like to have another couple plates on there, maybe. So originally that was a probably a, a 40 puff or a 50 puff trimmer capacitor and now it it probably is you know maybe 20 25 puff maximum so that's going to limit the BFO okay so we have the BFO on top of the R100 uh, one thing that's important uh, when you're working with a radio that does not have a product detector this radio just has simple germanium diodes uh, the injection becomes extremely tricky and critical compared to a real product detector the other thing, we're going to be using the 1 kilohertz um, tuning step. So you can go through the tuning steps with this thing. And we want the finest tuning step we can get. And on, on the scanner, the finest is uh, 1 kilohertz. Now the other thing, you notice there's an extra control here. That control sets the injection level. Because it's a simple germanium diode type system, uh, in order to get product detection at all, we have to be very careful about the amount of injection we use. I can tell here that we're possibly hitting a little hard because uh, we seem to always have the S meter. Yeah. So that's better. I just turned it down a little bit. It's not unusual to be you know, a kilohertz off. Let's try some CW. So it's broad as a barn, but uh, it is working. But we definitely uh, are hearing more than one station because the uh, this radio probably has about five kilohertz of bandwidth. Uh, that's it. That's that's as narrow as it gets here on AM. It probably is even wider than that, actually. So this is quite a primitive system. Now, if we overdo the injection we can completely overcome the signal. So we had to add a 500 ohm pot to uh, bring it down to a, a level where it will work properly.
that was interesting for you, uh, building a little BFO circuit. Uh, next we're going to play with these. These are ceramic resonators. And we're going to see if we can use one of these in a BFO circuit. And uh, maybe we'll, uh, we'll try it with another type of receiver, see what we can achieve.